Hi, I'm Joyce Krieger and this is ArtLink, conversations with artists, art consultants, designers, architects, art professionals, art lovers, and art collectors. My guest today is digital artist, or should I say tradigital tra artist, Jeff Mueller. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you. Great to be here. Welcome. Uh, tradigital painting. That's a name that you coined? No, it's a name that I found, but it took a long time to find that name. I was always, uh, there was a certain way that I was trying to de describe what I do and I couldn't, and it, you know, for two years I was trying to come up with it and then I was looking on Wikipedia and I saw it. It said Tradigital Artist and that, that instantly, I knew that's what I was. So that's kind of how that came about. Well, before we go into that, let's talk a little bit about your history. I know you were a graphic designer. You worked with your dad. Give us a little idea of how that morphed into who you are today. Uh, my dad uh, had, was very instrumental in developing me as an artist. He uh, didn't force me as a kid to do any art uh, type stuff. He kind of let me do it on my, my own. I drew, com you know, drew uh, drawings from comic books and, and whatnot and really kind of developed a love for art myself but uh, in 1980 he went into business for himself and he started to uh, develop me uh, take me under his wing and make me his apprentice teaching me uh, some of the minimal tasks that you do to uh, at a commercial art studio and then he kind of I've always been a loose uh, soul uh, I liked abstract painting. Wait a minute, a loose soul? <laughs> yeah, I, I like to, I like to, in, if, when I think about what I like in art, I like a lot of motion and free handing and uh, detail wouldn't be something that my soul would be into. I, I would love to do spatter art, that type of stuff. I did that in college, but my dad then in through training uh, uh, as a commercial artist, and he was a photographic retoucher and a realistic airbrush illustrator. Uh, he taught me the discipline that it took and the hours that it would take to match what was on a photograph with, you know, airbrushing and cutting masks and make it look photographic so that you couldn't tell for advertising. And he taught me that uh, uh, using watercolors in an airbrush. And then uh, in 1989, we... Uh, he put his whole life on the line. He mortgaged his house, got almost every friend he knew to invest in him, and we put in a Quantel graphic paint box, which at the time was a half million dollar investment, which wow. was very big for him being a one man studio uh, out working in Milwaukee. So uh, we did that and developed that studio, and it had its uh, had its time period because I think there was uh, twelve installations in the United States. And it turned out that in the end, there was two of them in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So that was kind of unique because we were always driven by the competition. But I did that all the way up to 2004. I was working and then the Macintosh started to come in. And uh, the G5 was the series of Macintosh that started competing with the Quantel paint box where I felt that my skills would transfer over to the Macintosh. Which so you when you switched over, let's say, to what you use now, Photoshop. Was it a big transition for you? Is it a big learning curve, or was it something you picked up easily? Well, picking up the paint box was fairly sim simple because I just, uh, my father had a hard time transferring to the computer, he, and he actually, in the end, didn't transfer. He went into sales. Uh, but myself and my cousin at the time, we both transferred well because we already had the relationship through video games somewhat. Uh -huh. And that, that translation between drawing on a tablet and looking at a screen at the same time is not that different than using a joystick or use, you know, and the, so that really wasn't a problem for us. As far as then um, going into Photoshop, that was nice because we had put a Macintosh in right away in 92, we had our first Macintosh system, and Photoshop was at, I believe, 2.5. And 
so I kind of developed with Photoshop along the way. So you keep upgrading every time Photoshop upgrades. Yeah, and now, right now, Photoshop is, has gone to this subscription base where you're, you're basically paying a monthly subscription and they update you for you. Uh, it's just always running the newest and best technology, which is pretty nice. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about what you are doing because it's very unique for painters out there and photographers. Jeff is sort of marrying the two in a very harmonious way and I think the audience is going to be interested to learn what you're doing and how you're doing it. Okay, so what I've done over, you know, through spanning my whole career is there's, there's certain uh, tools that I picked up and uh, skills that I picked up along the way. And the skills, there's every, every when you're um, uh, working in the commercial art field, the main thing that you're, that you're trying to do is once you've created the artwork in the computer, you're trying to have it then translate onto paper because everything that you're doing in commercial art is being printed, whether it be on a billboard, whether in a magazine or you know point of purchase packaging, and each each uh, part or, or you know dimension, it's almost like a dimension that you have to you, you had to learn the digital color and how it translated onto whatever medium you were printing on. So over the that time period, I was able to pick that up where I where if the monitor was the the colors were always. Uh, way more colorful and more intense but I started to understand the relationship and what colors worked better and then what colors were muted and which colors almost didn't work at all and then and then how the printing process process happened and that skill right now I've kind of taken that skill and applied it to canvas because I, I'm printing the digital imagery that I paint and it has to go onto the canvases. So I look at that skill right there as a very important skill and knowing what the colors are before they go on the canvas is very helpful because you can start to use the strengths of the printing process when you're creating your painting and then knowing the weaknesses, uh, don't put too much time into the weakness part of the printing process knowing that you're going to be painting that in with acrylic acrylic paints and making the whole painting as about as colorful as you could ever make a painting. Uh, the other skill that I, uh, when I was in college, I uh, picked up my painting skills with acrylics and for a long time I hadn't been painting because I was uh, working digitally and doing digital illustration and digital, but uh, after, at about, in about 2004 I started painting again. So I've been developing that particular skill and then also the digital painting part of the process and the photography part of the process which was something that I had acquired over you know my time as a digital artist so you're taking pretty much my whole career and all the parts of it and then creating fine art using each aspect of it alright so you're having dinner with your beautiful wife Rachel and something inspires you and you decide the next day to go out and take some photographs because you're going to develop a concept. How do we get from Jeff's brain from the camera to the computer to the output to the working on the output? Explain how that whole thing happens. Well, the best way to explain is the first painting where the idea kind of happened. Uh, I had wanted a, a small HD video camera and my wife had given it to me uh, as a present and we were out to dinner and uh, I kind of was experimenting with it and it had a, a camera on it, a very low res camera, it's not, it's even low res than a, a iPhone camera or whatnot. And we were, we were at a, an open grill restaurant and uh, while I was kind of videotaping it, playing with the camera, I came up with the idea, I actually have that video where I say that would be a great idea to do a painting. And that's kind of how the idea was born. I snapped with this low res camera uh, a bunch of photographs knowing that all of a sudden there was this, this, uh, 
painting this idea in my, you know, I saw it in my, in my brain. So I imported the video. What was the idea? Well, the, uh, one of the idea, what was the idea? Okay, the social uh, aspect, I had been uh, promoting my, uh, starting to brand myself on Twitter and Facebook. And I, and people with social media, you know, this had to be about four years ago, were criticizing social media because there were people that would just interact on the computer. You know, they were interacting on the computer and saying that more people are looking at their phones and they're not going out and they're not interacting. And I really felt that where we were at that restaurant and everybody was participating, all the tables, everybody was talking, at, and they were doing exactly what everybody say, was saying everybody wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to capture that, and that's what led to my social media multimedia series, which the whole thing, in, you know, everything that I'm doing, uh, it was it in my through my paintings and my expressions of my paintings was to show that although everybody is interacting on the internet, but they're also going out every day and interacting and networking the way that they always have. And when you combine the two, it kind of makes us, it, it, combining the two together is what you have to do today in order to promote yourself or brand yourself or express yourself as an artist. So I thought that that was a great idea to capture, go out into the physical world, capture people through photography, capture them networking and, you know, uh, being social, and then bringing it into the computer, uh, either in, in a lot of cases using uh, one photograph, but also I have the skills sometimes to add in and um, put together multiple photographs, use that as a reference, and then uh, create a painting. The way that I create the paintings in, in I use Photoshop because that's what, I've, what I'm good at and I've been trained at. And I create those paintings by getting, once I've gotten the composition and the color of the photograph, I use that as a layer. It's a layer. And then I create a... a but that layer is just for reference. Right. I use that layer for reference so that I can go back and forth. And I also use it for color. Uh, I will grab colors from, from the photograph. And then I use... A, tab, a Wacom, ta Wacom tablet, there's three different sizes, but I use the medium size. I don't like to use the big size, it takes up too much room. Uh, I have an iMac uh, on my desktop. And then I use a cordless pen. Now, one of the cool things about the pens is they actually give you tips that feel like a brush. And then when you're utilizing Photoshop, in Photoshop, there's brushes in Photoshop, and those brushes mimic real acrylic brushes. There's a fan brush. There's a, there's a straight brush, rounded tip, uh, angled brushes, left and right side. So pretty much all the brushes that you have to choose from when you're painting with acrylics, you have to choose from in Photoshop. So the, they've made the experience uh, in Photoshop where when you're painting to be very similar to when you're painting physically in the real world. So I always like to say that the main difference is when I'm painting in Photoshop is I don't get dirty. It's your virtual world. Yeah, I don't have to wash my hands all the time, and you know, and so, and I and I enjoy that part of it. So you get you so you take the painting, and you and I paint I paint the painting physically in on the computer, and when I'm when I'm happy with the results, I take that digital file and I send it off to the canvas printer. Uh, the canvas printer I've chosen uses 100-year-old Lightfast inks, archival inks. Uh, the, the canvas that they use, 100, uh, they use a blend, but it's one of the best blends that you can, you can put this, this type of imagery onto canvas. And then also the, the wood that they use for the canvas is uh, top of the line. It's not, it's not like just ordering from Costco. <laughs> And believe me, I've tested a lot of different canvas places. This, this place does a really a, a fantastic job. You uh, want to share with our audience who oh, that is? Oh, it's called uh, Simply Canvas. Yeah, you can find them. They, you, 
they work with professionals, but uh, they, they've been more than me as an artist and artists being picky. It's one of the nicest, nicest things is if they don't get it right, they will go to all ends. I mean, for the most part now, when I print out, I'm getting, they get it right. But it, there's been a couple times where they've, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. You weren't and, happy. And they fix it. They just fix it. It's all done and it gets to the point where I need it to get, where, where I need it to be. So then once I get that canvas and, I, and that's like your birthday, <laughs> you, it's just like to see a painting for the first time that you've been working on digital. And some of my paintings, I put 110, 120 hours. I put millions of brush, you know, 1.2 million, I think, on the last painting I've been able to calculate. And you put that, and you get to see it for the first time. And that is just, I, I, I usually don't even open it at where I pick it up. I bring it home and I kind of open it because I just want to be, it, that's like a personal moment. So once I, once I do that, I usually let it, I look at it and I, I wait a couple days. And then I decide what I'm going to do with the acrylics and how I'm going to paint it and what it needs to, to finish it. And then I finish it with the acrylic paints. So you've got this canvas now back from the printer. You're all excited and you've waited a couple of days. Now it's time for you to put paint to canvas. What happens at that point? Well, from that point, the canvas, it, it, I use a, I, I'm an acrylic artist. The oils are a little iffy on, I've heard horror stories that if you use oils that it can destroy the ink that you're, that you're painting on and acrylics being basically liquid plastic. Uh, are very uh, conducive to painting on, over the top of the inks, and I I paint on top of the on top of the my paintings to finish the painting. You don't cover the whole thing, right? right. And now, if it, now if the painting needs to be covered, I would cover it. There's the 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 newest one that I'm working uh, that I just finished someplace else. The background was, I designed that painting to paint the background in acrylics. I pretty much left through the digital process, I left o an open background oh. end. I didn't, I kind of gave myself a, a blueprint of where I wanted the stuff to go, but I also knew that I really wanted to um, paint that background using uh, blues because it was out of, the, out of black and it was very dark. And I wanted to bring um, some intense blues into the into the background. Um, Is that the one of the girl? Yes, yes. And so it, each each painting defines itself while it's going through that. You know, from the start when I'm working on it digitally, it defines what I'm going to do with the acrylics. Now, the one painting that was where the acrylics really really came into um, play was Fresh Market Decisions, because the background in the initial digital painting was burning out and when you looked at it it was it, it was a beautiful painting but there your eye just wanted to leave it it just kept leaving through all these burnout points uh, that that had happened from the original that I had put in on the original painting so I painted detail back in there was uh, it was it's in front of a fruit stand and up on top it was bananas and they were burnt. Well, I painted the bananas back in and I painted pretty much the whole top of the, the canvas back in so that you couldn't visually leave and then kind of played around with to keep you moving through the painting. So, Which is something you like to do. You love to have people move through your painting and you create a path for them to do that because we've talked about it. And Yeah, and that's that's the vision when I'm when I'm first going out looking for that particular painting, in my mind I see it, and and I see the the whole composition, and I know what I want it to look like, so I can see that before I even start. So then, once I go through whole, this whole process, I know I'm pretty successful. Is what if I'm what if I've done what I've originally seen, and usually that doesn't. Uh, let me down if I stick to what I originally w was hoping the painting to be. So give us an example of one of the paintings that you're talking about. Is this the painting that I saw of the marketplace or is this the painting that we're talking about in the um, diner? 
Yeah, well, as the process, the diner painting being the first one, that, that the, the process has, has completely evolved. Initially, I thought that I could, that painting, which you, if you take a look at that painting, the detail is nowhere near the amount of detail that you're, that you're capable of achieving. And throughout that 10 painting series, um, the detail just kept getting better and better, and I, I kind of refined the process. And then I did another five painting series of landscapes in Cape Cod, and that I kind of pushed the process as far as you could, putting as, about as much time and being as realistic. I called it like a hyper realism. Mm -hmm. But now, after I finished that, the last couple paintings, I've been kind of getting it to the point where I'm happy with the detail, but there's enough of the brush strokes where it's not as, not as, it's not so realistic that someone looks at the painting instantly and thinks it's a photograph. Because I want to be able to have them be wowed by the realism, but at the same time understand right away that it's not a photograph. I consider you like a serial marketer. I've seen your video blogs, of which you've done over a hundred of them. Can you tell our audience and maybe some of the artists out there how you go about promoting your work and how you promote yourself? I just started video blogging. A, a friend of mine, I had him do the camera, he became the cameraman and my narrator. So we kind of have a banter back and forth. But he was there with me to start off and I asked him if he wanted to do it. And he said, yeah, that sounds, sounds like fun. And we have a blast doing it. But the first ones are, I, I, I couldn't even watch them, but I still did them and put them up on, on, put them up on YouTube. And then after a couple of them where I felt like I was getting a little bit better, I started watching and then I was horrified. <laughs> and then I started working on uh, the technical part of speaking so that I didn't, uh, so I wasn't getting hung up on uhs and ums and that type of stuff. And I kind of refined that, and then I started working on how to express myself as far as what I'm doing, you know, what I'm trying to accomplish with, through my paintings. And that's taken a long time, even up to this interview today. I'm, I'm working on it all, all the time because I'm always talking to people, and sometimes people get it right away, and then other times they don't. And you really have to figure out, for the people who don't get it right away, how to you know, because you might only get in front of them once. And it's what only... I call the elevator pitch. Right, <laughs> right. So they, you want them to walk away understanding, not, it, not necessarily liking or agreeing with it, but just at least understand it. So that's where, where the video blogs, were, that's where that was kind of born out of. But at the same time, social media is so important because the old way of doing things was when someone came up with a niche thing, they would just kind of go and hide and try and keep their niche and do everything they could possibly do to keep everybody else from figuring out what they were doing. But I see today with young people and the new way of doing things is to share what you're doing. And I felt that if I could share this with everybody and video blog about it, maybe I could lay a blueprint down on what an artist working in the social media environment and also the the traditional environment that artists are working in, because you can't forget to work in the, into that area either. And then, you know, as I start to go along this journey, just document the journey. That's pretty cool. Is that something you'd recommend that artists do today? Well, I, I, the, the key to anything is just doing it. Once you start doing something, whether you want to start painting, you got to start painting. Or whether you want to learn a, a program, and you, you have to actually do it. And that's one thing that I stress in my video blogs is no matter what, it doesn't matter how good you are, just start doing it. So it's a commitment. Yes. You've had a lot of features in publications. How'd you get those? That is through social media. I mean, straight through social media, either most of it's through Twitter. I've got, I'm proud of the 5,200 Twitter followers. I make a list on Twitter, which I ask everyone who follows me if they would mind if I send them updates on my website or my video blog. And if they say yes, I put them on a list. There's, uh, it's about 650 right now. And so when I video blog, I send personal tweets to those 650 people so that 
they can see the video blog. I know a lot of artists today are starting out using Facebook and a few still are using, some are using Twitter, but you've done it very successfully and I'm glad you shared that with us. I'm glad to. Also. I know we talked a little bit about collaboration and one of the pieces that we'll be featuring is one of the collaborations that you did. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yes, uh, Bright Lights Big City, uh, after I had finished my social media multimedia series, I had uh, met an artist on Twitter and I was, I kind of got to know him. He's, it's Rod Jones out of uh, California and we had talked back and forth and he liked what I was doing and I kind of like, and he, he asked if I wanted to do a collaboration and I was kind of throwing out that I was interested in something, but I didn't really know how to how we would do this. Well, he was he said I've got a couple photographs you could choose from because before I was doing our, I am also a photographer, and and he sent me a photograph of a flower, and he sent me a, a I don't even remember what, and then he sent me a iPhoto um, phone a, a picture of uh, New York City from a low angle and it it was a uh, not the it was uh, i photo um pictures are not the the format that i like to work in so i said that that's the one i would like to choose choose from and I, and he and i said i also have this style that i've seen digitally that i really would love to try because with cityscapes i've seen other people do digital cityscapes and, and whatnot and I had an idea on it as far as forcing colors, changing colors of buildings, changing all the colors. And I said, I would really like to try that. And he said, that'd be a great idea. Why don't you use it? So I cropped the photo to be horizontal, not vertical, sent it off. He approved that. And his photo was uh, early morning and it was almost like a black and white photo of a, of a city. And it was perfect because then there were no preconceived colors that were even in the sky or, or what all the colors were out of my imagination and I was able to create that painting from his photo. So we collaborated and then both of us promoted it on Twitter. He did a press release and... So if anybody out there wants to collaborate with Jeff, is it okay if they contact yes, you? Yes, I, I love working with other artists. It's all about sharing. It really is. It That's just... great. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. You're welcome. It was great being here.